So hi again, everyone. Good afternoon from Austin, Texas. Thanks all for joining us today um, and welcome to the Digital Collections Lovin, sponsored by Texas Digital Library. My name is Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the DPLA Aggregation Service Coordinator here at TDL. Also with us today are several other folks from TDL, including our Executive Director, Christy Park, uh, Deputy Director, Courtney Muma, and lots of other TDL folks. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. So first, a little housekeeping. Um, as always, please do keep your microphones muted if you aren't speaking, but we love to see your faces if you feel like turning your video on um, or leave it off if that feels more comfortable for you. We hope you'll use the chat box to say hello, make comments and ask questions throughout today's presentation. Um, we'll have time for question, questions throughout, so do drop your questions and thoughts in the chat as we go. Um, chat is also where we'll be sharing out some links related to the information we'll share today. Um, as we were just talking about, live captioning is enabled for this webinar, and you can view live captioning by clicking on the closed caption button on your Zoom toolbar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, and we will publish slides and recordings on our website and in the TDL repository. We at TDL would like to acknowledge that while we're all joining this meeting virtually, we are meeting on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now North America, now called North America. I joined from Austin and the central Texas area where the Tonkawa were among the traditional stewards of the land before their forcible removal. Moreover, we'd like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Cado, Carrizo Comacrudo, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan Apache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all of the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. I invite you all to share your own land acknowledgments in chat if you would like to do so. Texas Digital Library is dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. And finally, Texas Digital Library is grateful to our members, many of whom are here today, who put your trust in TDL to provide essential library infrastructure and services like digital preservation, digital repository hosting, tools for managing ETDs and research data, support for open educational resources, and metadata aggregation for the Digital Public Library of America. We invite any institution interested in becoming part of our consortium to reach out to us. We need your energy and expertise to continue growing the digital library community in this region and invite you to connect with this truly wonderful, amazing, brilliant community of librarians and archivists. So as I said, I'm very excited to welcome you all to, to today's Digital Collections Lovin'. These events um, are my favorite to do. They're so much fun and I'm really excited to be here for another edition. Because it is Valentine's Week and International Love Data Week, TDL wants to share our love for digital collections and digital projects and for the people who make those projects happen. We know that a tremendous amount of work and effort and love goes into creating, maintaining, and sharing digital resources, whether that be cultural heritage collections, uh, scholarly research materials, exhibits, or other ways of interacting virtually with our collections. This event is meant to be a chance to celebrate that work and a chance for our community to show off all of the cool things that are in your digital collections and the cool things you're doing with them. For this edition of the Lovin, we especially wanted to bring attention to work that's being done to diversify digital collections and make sure that our digital spaces are welcoming, affirming, and just spaces. One of the ways that we show love for our communities is by striving for inclusive and respectful representation in our digital collections whether that is through seeking out and sharing materials that reflect the richness and diversity of our communities, um, undertaking reparative metadata initiatives, collaborating with communities outside of our library or institution, maybe even giving up power to those communities, or engaging in new research methodologies and using new tools for sharing knowledge. Many librarians, archivists, and others are doing great work to make changes to digitization, metadata, and outreach practices. And I hope that today we'll have a chance to see some examples of that work, um, in addition to other types of projects and collections, and to think and dream a bit together about what changes we'd like to see in metadata and digital collections to be more inclusive and welcoming. So as I said, we at TDL love digital collections and believe in sharing them as widely as possible. And one of the ways we do that is by helping our members share their digital collections through with the Digital Public Library of America through TextHub and TDL's metadata aggregation service. 
So if you're not familiar, the Digital Public Library of America is a project that aggregates digital cultural heritage materials from institutions around the country. It currently, currently includes metadata for over 47 million items, and all of those items are searchable through DPLA's website. Users who want to view the full object are then linked back to the item in its original institution's repository. Text Hub is what we call the Texas Hub for DPLA and is the pathway for Texas institutions to share materials with DPLA. Text Hub is a joint project of Texas Digital Library and the Portal to Texas History at UNT. As I'm sure many of you know, um, the Portal to Texas History provides services for digitizing, hosting, and creating metadata for digital collections. Metadata for materials in the portal has been included in DPLA for many years. And TDL's aggregation service enables institutions that host their own collections, no matter what system you use, to share metadata about those materials with DPLA. So whether you host your own collections or share them through the portal to Texas history, your institution can be a part of DPLA. Four TDL member institutions currently share uh, over 84,000 metadata records through TDL's aggregation service, which you can see some of those items on the screen here. And it's been really exciting to see that number continue to grow. If your library is interested in joining DPLA through TDL, uh, please reach out to me or to anyone at TDL and we'd love to talk with you about it. So, okay, here's how today's webinar is going to go. Uh, we have a great lineup of folks who have volunteered to share their digital collections and exhibits. Um, this webinar is meant to just sort of be a showcase of cool collections and exhibits and work happening at different institutions. So I've asked all these folks to talk about their sites and collections, um, but just for a few minutes each, so it's kind of lightning round style. So it should be a fun, fast paced way to see lots of uh, interesting materials. So I'll kind of call on folks and when it's your turn, just say your name, your institution, and a little bit about your site, whatever you think is interesting, unique, exciting, noteworthy about it. Um, I've split folks up into groups, as you can see here. Uh, so we'll hear from a few people, then pause for kind of questions and discussion after each group. Um, and as I said, feel free to, to add your thoughts to the chat as we go. Um, for folks who are speaking, please uh, do try to stick to no more than about five minutes per site so we can get through all of the, the great projects we have lined up for today. Um, I'll be sharing my screen throughout. So folks who are sharing, feel free to tell me what to click on or, or how to navigate around your site. And all of the links to the collections are in the community notes document. Um, so you can explore these great materials on your own as well. Uh, the link for the community notes document is on the screen and Leah just dropped it in the chat as well. Uh, so please do feel free to edit that document and add your thoughts, ideas, um, any, anything you think is worth saving there. We'll be sharing out the community notes document um, in the follow up email to everyone who registered for today. Um, so as I said, as folks are sharing, if you have questions or comments, um, please feel free to drop those in the chat. And then at the end um, of the of the webinar, we'll have some time for additional sharing and discussion. So I think that's it for the preamble. Uh, let's get going. Give me just one minute while I switch from sharing slides to sharing my browser. And then uh, Kristen and Beth from Texas Women's University, you are going to be up first. All right, are y'all seeing the, the Texas Women's Moments of Inscription? Yep. Perfect. All right, Kristen and Beth, take it away. <laughs> okay. Um... I'm gonna go ahead and start because the way that this project started um, was uh, my first semester in, um, in the PhD in rhetoric program. I took Ashley Bender's bibliography and research methods class. And one of the assignments was, this was a collaborative project with the entire class where we would go into the women's collection, um, look for, we would each find someone that we wanted to talk about, that we wanted to cover. We were looking for letters and we were going to bring out some of these people that we had, you know, some of these women that we had in the archives that, you know, we, that hadn't been talked about. We didn't know the, know that they were there. Um, also, I'm really nervous, so please bear with me. Um, we didn't know that, you know, that nobody knew that their material was in there. So we each picked someone, we had to digitize it, you know, we had to study it. And we learned how part of doing this was learning the ways that archivists shape the stories that are told to a certain extent that, because of what we picked and what we put on the website, that is the story that you'll learn because we were limited to what we could pick, you know, and how much material we could have. So it's, it's a way to see, you know, who creates the stories and who, you know, how they get their point across and also who doesn't get their stories out there because there was so much more in there that we could have used, but, you know, we couldn't. So 
that was uh, the beginning of the project. And it was, you know, it was a little um, stressful, you know, with when it's an entire class doing a group project together. <laughs> There's a little bit of stress, but we got it done. And then once it was all um, loaded up and we wrote all our reflections and our introductions, that's when we passed it over to Kristen. Kristen. <laughs> We're not hearing you, Kristen, sorry. Oh no. <laughs> we can come back to y'all later if that would yeah. be easier. Yeah. Yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we will, we'll come back for moments of inscription part two later on um well while Kristen figures out her mic situation let's move on um so next up is Rebecca from Rice talking about the Houston Arch collection um hello everyone I hope you can hear me yep all right um my name is Rebecca Russell and I am an archivist and special collections librarian here in the Wisdom Research Center at Rice University and um, the digital collection that I'm sharing with you today is the Houston Area Rainbow Collective History or ARCH Oral Histories. Um, these are a collection of oral histories conducted by undergraduate students at Rice who are part of a Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality course that is led by uh, Dr. Brian Riedel. <clears throat> and um, the oral histories that are um, online are from the past 15 years, so starting in about 2007, um, up to the most recent iteration of the class. Um, what is exciting about this collection is that it is complete, it's all student created. Um, the students are given an overview of how to conduct oral histories, uh, they conduct background research on their interviewees, and they record the interview as well as creating the transcript. Um, so Quality varies, um, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, there is not always a consistent um, output, but that also adds, I think, to uh, the uniqueness of the collection. Um, they uh, they create, they have an unedited oral history that we in the archive um, preserve and kind of keep on our, our Nearline server and we provide access to that. But what you see here in our uh, DSpace instance is an edited version and the students are the ones who edit that. So you really can see sort of back to what um, Beth was saying in, in their uh, collection, how they sort of craft the narrative that they want to share about their interviewee. And because um, they are the ones that are sort of selecting um, moments from the interview, the full hour and a half interview or two hours. So like for the, the first and the, under that recent submission, uh, Judge Shannon Baldwin, one of the highlights that uh, the, the students featured was her discussing how important it was to be the first African-American um, acting judge who was a African-American and out as a lesbian in Harris County. Um, the students, you know, edited that from the oral history or there is, um, an oral history with Juan Palomo, who was a columnist for the Houston Post in the 1990s. And um, after the Paul Broussard um, murder that took place in, that happened in 1991, you may not be able to find it on that because it's like buried, but um, he discusses making the decision to come out in his column and sort of the backlash that happened um, when he did that. So it's, it's interesting to see how the students sort of craft and um, create the oral history that they want to, to share for their interviewees. Um, one other thing that I will just say um, is that also because it's student created and it's in our digital repository, they have a persistent URL that they can point to if they wanna add this to their like portfolio of work that they want to highlight. Um, so that is something that they can always um, have on their CV. We also are in the middle of a digital collections platform migration here in the Woodson. We are um, moving our cultural heritage materials out of DSpace and onto Cortex. And so in May or June of this year, these will no longer, 
be here. They will be on a new platform. And we're hoping that some of the enhancements that the Cortex has will, will help um, sort of highlight these, these oral histories as well. There's like uh, enhanced searching capabilities with time-coded transcriptions. Um, we, start, we do that separately as a separate treatment with OMS. Um, and so that's sort of in the platform. Awesome. We're, sorry, I, I think I may have said that. Yeah, we're moving to Cortex. I saw a chat. Question. Yeah, yes. Yeah, thanks. Good luck with that migration. I know that that's always <laughs> exciting and stressful. Exactly. It is that, both of those things. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and I saw that Kristen says that she's back in action. So I'll switch back over here, Kristen, if you wanted to, to say any more about this exhibit. Can y'all hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> computers. Um, so yeah, so I began uh, work on creating the digital exhibit after um, Beth and her class was finished and what we started in the fall of 2019. And then of course, we all know what happened in 2020. Uh, so we really didn't get back to it um, really until the beginning of 2022, uh, uploading materials and figuring out how to create this digital exhibit. This is our first exhibit using Omeka, um, our Omeka Classic um, instance that we have it here at TWU. So this was a chance for us to figure out Omeka because there's a lot of interest um, in grants about using Omeka here at TWU, but we hadn't really used it a ton. Um, so what we did was we finished up, you know, all of the metadata and transcriptions that we did. And then we set up in the summer of 2022 weekly meetings with the faculty member, Beth and myself. Um, and we kind of built it all together and figured out what using the system looks like and what its abilities are and what its limitations are. And it really um, was just a great collaborative project between library, special collections, uh, faculty, it was really great. And in the exhibit, you can see that we have the introduction and then Dr. Bender uh, wrote the assignment page there. So it is so that users can understand, you know, what this, mm -hmm. what the reason for this was. And then each um, woman's collection is, is available and there are featured items that the students showcased, they wrote the introduction to the collection, and then each of the students wrote a reflection um, about their experience in the archives using the materials and what and the impact of the materials had on them. Um, so yeah, this was just a great um, opportunity to work collaboratively and learn Omeka, and it spawned a lot more collaborative projects. And we're planning to, we've sent a proposal for TCDL in May to talk um, kind of a little bit more about this exhibit, but more about faculty collaboration with the libraries. So maybe we'll see you then. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. Thank um, and, and great plug for TCDL. The call for proposals is still open if anyone is interested. Thanks so much, Kristen and Beth. Next up is Katie Pierce Meyer talking about the David Williams collection from UT Austin. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here today. So I'm talking about a project that's actually in my mind a little bit old um, in the sense that we conducted this project um, fairly early in during the pandemic. Um, and basically, we were thinking of a couple of things. Um, one is that we had a relatively new digital asset management system that we had launched um, a year or so prior that we were trying to, you know, get content into. Um, and then I'm the head of architectural collections, so I work with the library material and the architecture and spanning library and the Alexander Architectural Archives archival material. And, you know, um, as a lot of repositories do, we had a lot of legacy digitized material with like limited amounts of metadata or metadata in various different places or dispersed. And in one case um, with the Williams collection, we actually had um, a bit of item level metadata, which isn't very common for us in the archives. Um, but in this case, we had some very brief descriptions of these uh, photographs. And the photographs are 
um, were taken in the 1920s through the 1940s by David Williams, who is an architect, architectural historian, who drove around the state and photographed vernacular architecture. So many of the buildings and things that are in these images no longer exist. Um, and this is some good documentation of, of buildings and in some cases furniture, as you can see, from across the state um, at a time, you know, when they're uh, isn't a whole lot of documentation from this particular period necessarily, and especially of vernacular architecture. So this is great, um, interesting uh, photographs that we had a bit of document or a bit of description on, but not a whole lot, and certainly not enough to fill out what we would want to make available in our um, digital asset management system and then publish out to our collections portal. So. The challenge was how do we describe these things? And we have, it's about a uh, thousand images. And um, if 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 uh, there's anything to be said about the pandemic is it gave us an opportunity. It presented a, a, an opportunity perhaps to, to expand the opportunity to do this kind of descriptive work to people at UT libraries that don't normally do that work. Um, and I had a really great group of people who are uh, typically in our branch and borrower services unit um, who man service desks. And since the service desks were closed at the time, um, there was an interest in being able to do some other things to make some contributions. And so um, I worked really closely with Mirko Honka, who's our um, head of digital stewardship now, our head of, I forget his title, but at the time he was the dams coordinator. And he and I wrote some, uh, a workflow to allow people to take the metadata, the limited little bits of metadata we had, take the assets and do that descriptive work. And it was great because we had, um, I think, eight people from across the libraries that normally work um, in public service or in preservation um, and sometimes in content management who uh, don't normally do archival description, but this gave them an opportunity to sort of hone their skills in that area, learn a little bit. We had a really nice Teams chat going where they could ask questions of each other and of me, um, and that was really that was really fun. And they were really um, sometimes asking questions that challenged my architectural uh, terminology knowledge um, when describing pieces of buildings. And but it was great. And as a group, we all learned together, and it was really kind of fantastic. And the idea was for them to just you know describe what they see in these images, and that would make it hopefully more accessible to people too. So we're not necessarily looking for super um, always authoritative terminology for describing buildings, but like, what is it you actually just see when you look at this? Like, what are the things that you can, um, you know, natural language, what do you think of when you see this building? And so it's been a really great experience. And from that, we were able to um, take all the data that they entered and, uh, run it through a couple of scripts in order to break those up and get those ingested into our digital asset management system. And so it's been a really great sort of crowdsourcing kind of method uh, for us to do with this local group of, of library staff who are fantastic. The other thing I wanted to highlight about this that's interesting is that many of these, like I said, were unidentified initially um, and a lot still are, but in some cases we had years ago a, a former faculty member who sat down with them and tried to gave us some potential locations and maybe building descriptions for things, but very limited. Um, and that's included in these records. And then since we've put them up online, we've had a couple of people reach out to us, um, one of whom is is like a, a donor who gave us his archival collection. And he and his wife are both in, uh, one, he's a historic preservation architect and she's an interior design kind of um, preservation person. And so the two of them actually just for fun have been looking through these images and finding things that we don't know, identifying buildings that were unidentified previously, giving us more information about things. And we've actually had a follow-up from an architect in Louisiana who also did the same thing. He just stumbled upon the site, was looking at it and has identified stuff. So I'm, I continue to think of this as like the crowdsource project that just keeps on going and the crowd keeps getting bigger. And I think it's great. And it gives us an opportunity to um, make these things available and continue to enhance the records. And so I've, I've definitely continued to touch these uh, records for all of these all the time. Um, this platform is 
our collections portal, which is built in Blacklight, and the back end is um, Islandora. Thanks so much, Katie. Sure. That's that's awesome that folks have continued to find it and and share information about it with you. That's it's been that's very helpful. Really gratifying that gratifying that people are interested enough in in our collections to want to contribute that way. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Uh, next up is Clarissa West White from Bethune Cookman University. Uh, ew. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, so I am, as he said, Clarissa Westwhite from Bethune Cookman University. I am the newly appointed since May of last year university archivist and assistant professor. Um, I came to the library out of English. And so I have worked at a number of places in Florida and I ended up at Bethune Cookman not knowing much about the founder. And so what I have come to learn, I have come to learn through the archive. And her archive is here in the library. And one of the ways we have of bringing people closer to her um, is through our collections. So some years ago, because I was not here when they did this, there was a grant with, um, I want to say the Florida Humanities, but maybe not, but it was Florida something. So it was either state of Florida or somewhere. Um, and University of Central Florida was, was one of the um, universities. I think Stetson University was the other one and maybe Embry-Riddle. Um, and so the um, University of Central Florida library houses our collection. Um, they also house the collections from the other institutions. Um, how this is helpful for us is one, a lot of students like um, well, I, I didn't attend here, but the notion that you attend a university named after someone and you're not sure who the person is. And I am always, um, re always regret not learning about her as a native Floridian um, in school. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune is our founder and she is one of many firsts. Um, and the latest first is the first African-American to represent a state in statuary hall in the U.S. Capitol. And so we know she's great, but getting other people to understand why we think so is a battle. And so we are, um, we try to bring as many people to these collections as possible. So if you click on the first one, the um, first one is images, the second one is text. They digitized our yearbooks and um, a collection of photos. They did not digitize all of our photos, but these are the ones that they did. It is searchable. So if you're looking for a particular person or a particular name is very helpful um, because a lot of graduates or a family of graduates or um, employees will say, I know my uncle did something there. Can you find me any information? And so it's really easy to just send them a, um, this link and have them do some of that work on their own. Um, and then they'll email and just say, wow, I didn't know you had so much. And they'll just kind of spend the rest of I don't know their time <laughs> um, searching, but it is, um, it turns out to be a really wonderful use. We get a lot of requests to use the photos um, from the Smithsonian to other archives, um, other libraries um, want to, you know, borrow something here or there. And many of the photos uh, also feature local spots on campus. So students sometimes use them to do a before after. Um, there are some buildings that are here and uh, photographed that clearly are no longer here on the actual campus. Um, and so this helps a lot. If you could go back to the text, we also send um, family there um, a lot because again, the notion of trying to find out did William Johnson attend Cookman in somewhere in the 60s you know, I'm the only archivist. Um, I have some volunteer, some students who do work study, um, some volunteers in the fall, but otherwise, you know, I receive on average, maybe about four, three to four requests a week. And they range from requests for photographs to um, uh, someone uh, recently read a obituary from, some, from an author and the author donated their some works here. And so now they want to know where did we receive the works and where are they? And so, you know, it's a lot of 
just kind of going back and forth with people on campus, um, a lot of turnover. So it's hard to track some of this down. Uh, and so the notion that for people who just need photos and that kind of brief information, this um, collection has proved very, very helpful. Um, and some of these, again, uh, students get a kick out of reading because they are also like the original rules of the college. The college was founded in 1904 uh, for girls primarily. So it started as an elementary school, middle school, then a high school, then a two-year um, no, uh, a vocational institute, then a two-year college, then a four-year college, and then a university. And so for students, when we try to you know, maybe look at some policies, we can actually go back to what the founder felt about or said about some things and then kind of show them that, you know, we're not as strict um, as you may think, because uh, we have devi deviated quite a bit from her original views about student dress, decorum, um, et cetera. So that's my piece. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I I love hearing about how much use this collection gets. And, and like you said, being able to send that to people and and let them sort of search for themselves, their family members, that's really cool. Thanks so much. And so next up, uh, Whitney Johnson-Freeman from UNT. You here, Whitney? Yes, I'm here. Hey. Um, so I wanted to present the Chronicles of Oklahoma collection. It is um, sponsored by the Oklahoma Historical Society. They publish a quarterly journal and they have for over a hundred years now. And they um, worked with us to put that online. And so our initial phase was just putting the full issues online, but now we're actually breaking up the issues into articles just to make them more discoverable um, and hopefully more usable for researchers. Um, why I wanted to present it here is because Oklahoma's history obviously has um, a lot of contentious and, and violence um, events in it. And so doing metadata for these types of uh, materials is a real challenge for myself and my graduate students. So um, we have hopefully tried to make it as um, accurate and inclusive as possible while also making it relevant for researchers. One thing that we um, are doing to support this is we have a big subject, um, basic thesaurus that we have shared with the Oklahoma Historical Society. So if they see something in there that they don't um, think is appropriate or would prefer another term or something like that, um, then we can easily identify that and go back to our system and update those articles to take out that metadata term. So far, cross our fingers, we haven't had an issue. We are trying to rely on the um, Library of Congress subject headings for a lot of our controversial um, subjects, but um, it is really just a, a each year as we go back, we're in the 80s right now, um, is different. And we, we can see as we go back how they treat some um, events differently. So, um, so far, it's been relatively straightforward, but we, um, I talk with my students a lot who are doing the metadata for this. Like if they're ever uncomfortable about anything, then you know we can talk about it. I will do the metadata for you um, or, or anything like that. So um, hopefully it's interesting. And if anybody has any advice or help, um, we are always open to that. So thank you so much. Thanks, Whitney. That's That sounds like great work. Um... I, I love what you mentioned about kind of collaborating with the Oklahoma Histor Historical Society and using their sort of knowledge and domain expertise to help kind of guide what's what's appropriate and what's useful and and helping using that to kind of help be really thoughtful about the way you're describing. I think that's really cool. So that's. That's our first group of sharers. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Any questions or comments or or anything folks want to say about those first group of sites before we move on? Saw there were a couple questions in the chat. All right, hearing none, then I guess we can keep going. 
Um, so next up is a double feature from UT San Antonio, Moira McKay and Kristen Kirsten Cutts. Hi, uh, I'm Kirsten. Um, I guess since we are on the um, ITC project, so we're both with the UTSA libraries. I work at the Institute of Text and Culture as Moira works with the Special Collections. Um, we're all under the same kind of administrative umbrella. Um, but I am going to talk about a project that we did on our sharecropper cabin. So um, as you can see here, we, we created a virtual tour um, for a cabin that we have um, on our exhibit floor has been installed there since 1980. Um, so we started this project with a grant that we received in early 2020 from the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, and the intended mission of the grant and title of the project was digitizing the cultural heritage of Texas. And this is actually pre-pandemic, turned out to be really good timing, but the idea was to make our exhibits more accessible to people, whether they could be in the museum or not. So um, that would involve um, going through the cabin. We, with the funding from the grant, we were able to get um, certain technology and software and a really nice camera so we could um, do one of those virtual walkthroughs of the exhibition and Elliot if you want to just like click around and explore I'll be able to kind of vamp on that but yes so we took these 3D photographs of our cabin um, and the goal of the project was to continue to build distinctive research collections documenting the diverse histories and development of San Antonio and South Texas. And that involved us doing more research onto the items that we had in the cabin itself, the objects that had been chosen and placed there in 1980 to contextualize the exhibit, um, because we were going to, again, create these 3D photographs and create new descriptions for them. Um, and a lot of these items actually um, came from our demonstration collection, um, which we've developed over the years. So sort of items that we would give out to teachers, put in our education kits, things that we didn't mind touching. And if they got lost or damaged, it wouldn't really be um, that um, that much of a, a disaster, um, which also meant that we didn't really have information on where those came from, their origin, their manufacturing. So it was a lot of digging through um, different records um, and a lot of honestly Google image searching to see like, well, I have this sewing machine and part of the number is kind of identifiable. So we'll see if I can go on and find something equivalent. Yes, that machine right there. Um, but for examples like this, we were kind of saying, well, if we can't say exactly where this machine came from or give really detailed information about its technical history, then we're going to describe it in a contextualized way because we really wanted to use this um, virtual exhibit opportunity as a chance to re-examine how we had been presenting this um, residence. People lived here. You know, we have a whole history of we know where it came from. We know um, a good bit about the people who at least owned the land that it was on. Um, but we really wanted to represent this cabin and the items in it as like, this is a place that people live, this is what they use, this is what their life was like. Um, and that leads to, um, let me go on here. So um, we wanted to not just give information about the physical um, background of the objects, but we um, pulled a lot of our information, both from the records of the original um, exhibition, but also from, um, oral histories that the original researchers had conducted during the development of the cabin. Um, so a lot of these items here were donated to us um, by people around Texas who actually had been sharecroppers or their families had been sharecroppers. Um, and the researchers and the staff took the opportunity to interview them and ask them what their lives were like. How did this item that you're giving us, how did you use it? How did it interact in your life? We really wanted to make that relevant and accessible for visitors. And um, so this is an oil can and this is what it was used for. And, um, it's really informed how we are redeveloping our interpretive uh, material now that we have people back in our museum again and we have tours in. Um, and actually, there is one item that I want to highlight in particular. So, Elliot, if you're able to find your way back into the bedroom, I think there should be a chair somewhere. Never tried to remotely direct him. Yes, this green striped chair. Um, so, one of the main um, materials that we um, pulled from were the, if you could click the learn more icon actually. So uh, more of this um, exhibit, in, in addition to the virtual tour that we just walked through, we have fairly long um, sections that talk about the artifacts in detail. Um, and this chair in particular is a part of a collection of items donated to us by Eugene Bullard, um, who was a member of a couple that Joe Graham, who was one of the original ITC staff in 1970s, interviewed um, and conducted an oral history with the Bullards as part of the development of the original cabin exhibition. And so for this project, we were able to take that oral history, 
pull material from those interviews, use it to inform both the material that we produce for our website and the virtual exhibit, and also link directly to the transcripts of those interviews that we have um, that Special Collections has digitized and available on their library website. Um, and we were also able to kind of go through research. It was a lot of kind of digging back into the history of the ITC itself, which doesn't always have the best institutional records. So it was a lot of hunting and exploring for that. But um, I don't know if we have a link to it right here, but um, other sections of the, the cabin site, we have like about our cabin artifacts and actually um, might be under the about our cabin, perhaps. I have a whole list of links and I haven't mapped out how they went. Um, I think, yes, so um, this learn about the Bullard's icon here, we were able to really focus on these individuals that inform so much of the original content and really our re-envisioning of the content um, and um, kind of do try to do justice to them, even though it's been years since we were originally able to speak with them and they've been, um, they've both been passed on for a few years now. Um, but this cabin exhibition, again, we started it right at the beginning of the pandemic, trying to be very timely, um, and having this virtual exhibition and the research that we went to, um, the, or the research paths that we followed for it, and the um, trying to individualize um, and contextualize the exhibit in a way that um, did justice to the people who lived there and their experience has really been a foundation for a much broader re-envisioning and refresh of our entire African-American area in the ITC. Um, so while we were able to kind of do a sort of crowdsource metadata procedure for um, developing the descriptions of the items in the cabin because we're pulling from oral histories, we're, maybe this is a bit loose, but I think we're trying to follow that same pattern with our new exhibitions. We just recently opened one um, that was produced in collaboration with the African American Quilt Circle of San Antonio. We have several original um, story quilts on display in the ITC now, and we've been working with them pretty consistently um, and asking them like, hey, like tell us about this quilt and tell us all the details involved in its production and its significance. And like, what, what else do you want us to include? Like when we're talking about this with visitors and we're writing about it for you know external pieces for our library publications, like what do you want us to include? Um, so really um, relying on them to um, tell us not just about the objects that they're giving us directly, but also helping them, um, helping, they're helping us know how to focus our research. We want to create more material out of it down the road. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. This is so cool. Um, I, I love the experience of doing the virtual tour. I love what you're saying about sort of wanting to um, really highlight that this was a place that people lived and like, what were those people's lives like? Um, that's really, that's really cool. So next up, Moira, were you going to talk about the Mapping the Movimiento yes. exhibit? Awesome. Cool. Um, so yes, we did a pretty big walking tour of the Chicano activism in San Antonio. And this was conceived during the pandemic, which, you know, get the virtual tours and get people out um but it was also a little bit conceived just because i think at least i do a lot of the outreach events and we would have people looking over activism so i would be like i didn't know texas had this kind of material i thought it was all in california and no the 60s and 70s in texas was very much part of the chicano activism um so this was conceived very, very closely, collaborated with every step of the way with community members and those that were activists at the time. Um, we started doing um, not interviews with folks that we would reach out to, to try and get them to kind of name places or what they thought were important, um, which places in San Antonio had the most importance to them in terms of Latino progress and Chicano activism. And um, the ones we collected and ended up using, because there were many, many, many of them, um, are the ones that overlapped the most in between all of the different folks that we interviewed. Um, I think 
as we went on, we ended up doing a lot of research in our own special collections with people from the community, which again, this was all made when we didn't have access to our buildings, <laughs> but we did the best we could in terms of virtual reference. And um, this was going, having to digitize material that wasn't already digitized, having to find material pictures of things that we definitely didn't have pictures of, even though they were very, very clear. Like this, like there's one in particular, Mario's restaurant, um, it's very, very important to the Chicano activism. It's where everyone went to eat and hang out and discuss. I think um, we ended up finding photos of kind of a rising Nita uh, meeting there and um, a picture of Mario himself that I think someone found somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, same with the um, mock headquarters. We had a little bit of trouble finding like clear pictures of that. Um, but it's just, we had to get creative and we had input from the people, from community members, but some of those community members were also people that had donated their collections. So they knew their collections well enough to point us in the right direction. And um, that was really, really helpful for us. <laughs> um, but they also really, we were with them every step of the way in terms of description as well. and that helped to know what they call the place or why that place was important. And that's what you need to stick in the description, each one. Um, so the gallery has everything cited. And so you don't have to watch the video with the voiceover. And you can just see the materials. Um, the voiceover was done by John Philip Santos. And it's pretty fun. You can actually sit there in your car and just plug your phone in and listen to it. Um, we did a tour, kind of like a test tour with one of the San Antonio student groups, uh, but one of the UTSA student groups, and they rented out a school bus and had like a big speaker on the floor and just plugged it in. And uh, Kirsten and I both went and <laughs> got to experience the tour with them. And that was, it worked. It, we were really excited that it worked. <laughs> um, and it was it was kind of cool to actually see it as like a realization. Um, and we had uh, one of our contributors, uh, Ellen Riojas Clark, came along for the ride and kind of supplemented what was already in that. And we hope that that can be used more that way. That's always fun. Um, we did have a little bit of trouble in terms of we we don't think we're going to use story maps again just because we found it a little bit limiting um particular in particularly in terms of alt text um it had not a large number of characters so we ended up not really doing descriptions so much as the citations and it would be nice to be able to format that a little different um, in our next one. Um, but yeah, I think it was, we hope to kind of maybe continue and make a bigger one with more four sections. But for now, this was the the big spots. And hopefully we can add more to it in the future. Thanks, this is so cool. Um, I love the idea of taking a bunch of students around on a school bus and listening to the audio tour. Like Natty said in the chat, I wanna go on the next tour. It was really fun. <laughs> I, might, I might take myself on a driving tour of San Antonio with this. Um, I saw Alyssa's question in the chat, is, is any of this content available in Spanish? Um, I don't believe so. I think we talked about it, right, Kirsten? or but it didn't we didn't yeah into it. that that was definitely discussed so this was a, um i was also working on this project and um that was something that we talked about a lot throughout the development of it and a lot of the time like especially because we interviewed so many people and we had this massive list of places that were mentioned and had to like it was very challenging to figure out okay what what do we actually have the capability to cover and include and how are we going to 
um, make those choices and make those cuts. Um, so I think we are, we were talking pretty early on about like, this is our first installment. And when we do it again, we know we won't use story maps and we'll include these, these, these features and we'll, you know, pull information from these areas. So it was a kind of a very much a, we were doing a lot of pilot projects in the first year of, of quarantine. Um, and this is one of them, but I think a really successful one that we've gotten a lot of great reception for wanting to do again. And part of that would be to include um, versions and material that were in Spanish. Awesome, thanks. Wonderful, okay, moving on next along the list is uh, Ted Mallon from Georgetown. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, actually, my it's Mallison, but that's- Oh, okay. I'm so um, sorry. No, no problem, no problem. Um, yeah, so my name is Ted Mallison. I'm the digital production coordinator for the Maryland Province Archives at Georgetown. So a little bit of background about this project. Um, so in like 2015, 2016, uh, Georgetown University started looking at finally addressing its history with enslavement and making some sort of reparative efforts. Um, so in Georgetown's case, uh, the university was founded in 1789 by the Jesuit Order of Maryland, uh, which was called the Maryland Province of the Society of Jesus. Um, and the Jesuits owned tobacco planta plantations throughout the state of Maryland and used enslaved labor to work those. Um, you know, furthermore, there was also evidence that a lot of the construction on the university was made using enslaved labor. Um, but most damningly, um, at the time, uh, what was starting to come out into more public light was that, um, at least in terms of connecting the university directly to the to the uh, institution of slavery was in 1838 a group of between 272 and 314 enslaved persons were sold by the Jesuits um, specifically to bail out uh, what was then Georgetown College from financial difficulty. So this was something that started to come to light because of um, a couple articles that were written. It was an open secret, you know, um, as these things usually are, um, but it started to come to light when the the student newspaper um, started publishing articles about it and then the New York Times picked it up and so it became a thing that um, the university administration wanted to contend with officially. Um, so in 2016, the university convened a working group on slavery, memory and reconciliation and um, a range of initiatives um, aimed at doing re reparative work came out of that, uh, one of which was the um, reprocessing and the digitization of the archives of the Maryland Province of the Society of Jesus, which we usually just call the Maryland Province Archives or the MPA. Um, so this, what Elliot is sharing is the um, digital archives of the Maryland Province of the Society of Jesus, which is built um, using DSpace. Um, so reasons for digitization being, you know, pretty critical for what we wanted to do. Um, there has been for many, many years, um, way before 2016, a community of descendants who trace their lineage back to those who were enslaved by the Jesuits. So the Maryland Province Archives have long been a resource for those doing um, that sort of genealogical work. So digitizing the MPA um, is a means of making those records more accessible to the growing community of descendants. And it is growing. Um, thanks to things like Ancestry.com, you know, or Ancestry.org, and a future means of connecting our records to other Jesuit records around the country um, that deal with enslavement. Um, so like I mentioned, the MPA has also been uh, reprocessed at the same time um, that I've been digitizing. So this presented some unique challenges in terms of, um, you know, having to make changes after the fact, um, because the, the reprocessing has only just completed um, this past October. Um, so the new finding aid is online and available. Um, the digital collection is still, still incomplete, still a work in progress, but should be finished um, sometime this year. Um, you know, because the finding aid for the collection was woefully out of date um, and the arrangement and description was not up to contemporary standards. So reprocessing was, was important as well. And so there's been a lot of reparative work in that area and um, that's being reflected in the digital collection. 
So a bit about the collection itself. Um, the MPA is pretty vast. Uh, it's a little under 300 boxes, uh, and it covers the years 1630 to 2003. So, you know, a little over three and a half centuries, right, from the earliest years of European encroachment up until almost the present day. Um, the collection includes correspondence, maps, land surveys, land grants, financial records, you know, and so forth. Um, there are also other accessory collections of individual Jesuits that contain records relating to slavery and records that relate to interactions with indigenous peoples as well. Um, and many of those ha have been digitized already or will be digitized once the main collection is finished. So like, for example, we have this, this is not yet digitized, but is, is one of the things that um, will be hopefully in the future is a, a prayer book, you know, that a Jesuit in the 18th century translated into the Piscataway language. This is like my favorite thing that I always like want to tell people about just because it's so fascinating. Um, because as far as anybody can find, it's the single extant record of the Piscataway language. It's sort of the Rosetta Stone um, of the Piscataway language. Um, so some really incredible materials relating to indigenous history as well as black history in, in the Jesuit collections that we have. And that's sort of like an extension of the MPA digitization is digitizing those, those um, sort of auxiliary Jesuit collections. So like I said, Elliot is sharing the main page um, of the MPA digital collection in Digital Georgetown, which is our institutional repository, which is built uh, with DSpace. But um, I was going to go ahead and share in the chat um, one item of note. Um, I'll put it in there and you can look at it at your leisure. Um, but this is actually um, the list of people to be sold in the 1838 sale. Um, and this names 272 enslaved people who would all eventually be sold to plantation owners, mostly in Louisiana. Many of the descendants that I spoke about trace their ancestry to these um, people. Um, and it's actually a surprisingly large number of people across the country. You know, um, it's, it's amazing how, how these, you know, genetics spread out and how many people have already been able to, through, through genealogical research, connect themselves to their, to their ancestors. Um, and as I said, it was the sale, you know, that really precipitated all of this, this reparative work in the first place. So this um, um, census of people to be sold um, has sort of been like one of the, one of the um, flagship sort of artifacts that we, that we point to. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. Um, I hope you can all take some time to look through the MPA digital collection. Like I said, it is an ongoing project. So it's not yet complete, um, but there is the new finding aid that I mentioned, which is complete. And I'll share that also in the chat. Um, and that was um, created by my colleagues, uh, Cassandra Berman and uh, Mary Beth Corrigan, who are here at Georgetown. Um, and they did some really great work in terms of um, doing reparative work on the language and, and so forth, because that finding aid had last been done in uh, 1920 and then slightly updated in 1995, but, you know, was definitely in need of, of, of a new arrangement and, and some updates to the language. So, um, yeah, and I can answer any questions if you have any. Thanks a lot for uh, listening. And thanks, Elliot, too. for. Asking. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, Ted. This is great. It's important work for sure. All right. So, Moving along then. So next up, we have uh, Dr. Kenton Ramsby from University of Texas at Arlington. Hello, everybody. Uh, it says Morgan, but I'm so sorry about that. My name is Kenton Ramsey. I'm an associate professor of African American literature and digital humanities. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks for being in this digital space today. You know, it's quite fitting. So I'm really humbled to be here and hearing some of the work going on. Um, I kind of want to talk about this a little bit because I'm also very embarrassed about the Jay-Z project at this point now, just because I feel like I've come at least developed so much over the past seven years or since this has been published or over the past um, what year is this? Five years since this has been published. Um, I first like to start by saying, even though I'm in English, I look at my um, my 
profession is being rooted and routed to the development of Black studies. So in 1969, during the San Francisco State University strike, uh, the students just uh, wrote up a justification for Black studies where they said that they wanted classes to uh, prepare students to actively participate in issues that kind of, you know, confronted the Black community. In the era of big data, I'm thinking to myself, how can data kind of, in some ways, be integrated into Black studies? So this idea, you all, with data scraping, data wrangling, data visualizations, oftentimes, um, I've realized I try to create different gateway points for my students to enter into. So I published the Jay-Z uh, mixtape to kind of coincide with my course to give students an idea about how we might scrape data. And the reason you might be thinking, why Jay-Z? Why Jay-Z? Well, I'm a literary scholar, and when we look online, we can't necessarily find an actual database that has all of the allusions and references in various novels. Copyright is a real big thing that we're still contending with. However, with rap music and music in general, there is an incentive to at least see how often people are sampled, how often these things are done, more so than that there are so many online websites such as Rap Genius, even Wikipedia, that have compiled information in much more extensive of ways that has been done that has not been done for traditional literary studies. So oftentimes I see Jay-Z as a gateway figure to thinking about data scraping, data, uh, data curation, and also visualization techniques. So with the Jay-Z mixtape, I really want to think about this concept of signifying, this idea of sampling to see that I think Jay-Z is a fantastic person to think about in terms of this is happening, how often he's referencing different music. So I love the idea to kind of reference Amir Baraka, the changing same, how nothing is new under the sun, but uh, instead, you know, we're kind of recycling and repurposing different things. Now, I bring this up. Is there any way we can go to the actual samples? I'm sorry, if you go to the left hand side, yes, go down to visualization samples and click over to the next screen, next two maybe. Yes. One more. Yes, amazing. We can scroll down. So you all, for instance, I wanted to at least uh, think about how can we visualize African-American literary theory? Professor Henry Louis Gates in 1988 published this concept of the signifying monkey, right? So um, I wanted to at least think about how can we see what's actually going on within this rap music? You know, what's going on? So the idea is with this, we uh, pulled on these various things extent to which Jay-Z signifies. On the one hand, uh, there's no data repository we can pull on to see all the real life events that happened, for instance, in say, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. It's this part of the novel where he says, cast your buckets down, where he's alluding to Booker T. Washington's speech, but oftentimes those things go over readers' heads and particularly what's going on. Um, so with this actual visualization, with this actual book, I was trying to think, how can we think about what's going on with literary theory and actually show how the rap music is indebted to soul music of the 60s and the 70s in terms of it being repurposed. On the one hand, I like this is because it kind of seems for at least my students, it lessens, it, it kind of evens the playing field a little bit when thinking about data, for instance, because oftentimes, especially, it, I'm, I'm saying this in a way, particularly for black and brown students, it's oftentimes seen as intimidating because we don't see often many projects that represent these people, uh, represent black and brown people. However, with rap music, I find it so interesting because students get into the class and thinking all we're doing is rap and then they start to look at the data and then they start to look at all of the other things and they get so impressed with what you can do uh, with these things. So this was my first attempt as a junior professor and I must say this too. Uh, I was hired at the University of Texas to think about you know teaching digital humanities classes in English but there were no data repositories with information related to African American literature. So I draw on who's I drew on who sampled to kind of make a data set that's been published within the Texas data repository and we've used this to ask a series of questions about Jay-Z's music. One of the reasons I I also chose Jay-Z is because between 1996 to present day, he's released 13 solo albums. Between 96 and 2002, he released an album every single year. So we've been able to see how he changes, not only in his rap, but with the particular producers that he's used. Now, I do want to drop one more thing into the chat for you all. 
again, this is where I started with Jay-Z to at least begin asking questions, thinking about what does it mean to visualize information related to Black literary art. But recently, I was awarded a grant by the Mellon Foundation. And as a co-PI, I've been, I've uh, curated and founded this online portal called the D Literary Data Gallery. If you could scroll over to one of the ones that says Wikipedia, I'm sorry, not the first one, I believe, the first box to the left-hand side, right here. Could you do that? Yes. So again, how can we use public data sources to actually help the wider audience engage African-American literature, finding out different information? So for instance, I scoured Wikipedia and found out out of all since uh, 2015, only 13 novels have received 1 million or more views. And I'm trying to invite different types of questions, thinking about not only just the content and thematic content of African American literature, but also the publishing side of things. Also, how is the public consuming these things? In 2023, I believe visuals, data visuals particularly, can uh, be used for, uh, can be used for the larger public to invite more people into thinking about Black artists, particularly Black verbal art. So again, as I say, I'm embarrassed about the Jay-Z project, not because of the idea, but just because of the idea that I feel like I have grown so much in thinking about better ways to visualize information and better ways to speak to people outside of the academy. I also want to add the reason I use Jay-Z is because oftentimes I'm asked to speak and often asked to host digital humanities workshops where I engage people with Tableau Public, um, Tableau public and just data curation. I oftentimes feel like Jay-Z is an interesting thing because I'll walk into a classroom and say, Tony Morrison's the best writer. People write it down mindlessly. Langston Hughes, the best poet. People write it down mindlessly. And then I'll say, Jay-Z is the best rapper. And so many hands go up. So with that being said, I like that we're thinking about data, we're thinking about visualizing things, and we're also debating the at least the expansive nature of Black verbal art. With that being said, I hope you all will see the look, take a return to the literary data gallery as it continues to grow and evolve. And I want us to keep in mind this literary data gallery was inspired by my work with Jay Z in terms of thinking about curating data as well as visualizing data to reach uh, a larger audience, because this is the goal, after all, to get more people engaged with Black text by providing various entry points. So again, I'm really happy to be here with you all today virtually, and I am, yeah, just grateful. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing this work with us. It's really incredible. Um, like you said, it's it's sort of it's so fascinating to see the process of both kind of building this data set, visualizing it, teaching with it, using it to kind of draw people into thinking about all these questions you're talking about. Really, really wonderful, and I I'm excited to to explore this gallery much more. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, next up is uh, Katie Lucas from the University of Denver. This is gonna be such a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> but this you're gonna do great. what I get for responding so late to your email, Elliot. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Katie Lucas. I have a lot of titles, actually. Do you just want the one related to this project or do you want all of them? <laughs> Whichever you feel like sharing, up to you. All right. Well, um, I am a reference and processing assistant at the University of Denver Special Collections and Archives. I am a circulation assistant at the Westminster Law Library in Sturm College of Law. I am a digitization consultant uh, for the Park County Local History Digital Archive. And I'm also a processing and digitization assistant at the Barco Library and the Cable Center. I don't get any sleep, um, so I'm sorry if I'm a little tired. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk to you about one of my jobs, which is uh, helping out at the Park County Local History uh, Digital Archive specifically, which is a joint project between the Park County Local History Archives and the University of Denver. Um, I believe it's funded by a CRAB grant, uh, and it's been going on since, I want to say, the tail end of 2019. Um, so there, were, there were some delays. I think there was something going on in the world in 2020. Uh, and it's, yeah, who knows? Uh, and it's uh, essentially an initiative to kind of document the history of uh, Park County, Colorado. 
um it's uh it's got a lot of it's it's got a con con kind of conglomeration of materials uh photographs manuscripts um various documents and things mainly from uh donors from around uh park county itself uh they've gotten a few donations from uh descendants and family members uh from current residents um, and even some of the volunteers that have been working with this project specifically have actually gone out and taken photos themselves and then donated it to the archive. Uh, so if you want to go, yeah, you can go to that there and then browse collections. Um, yeah, these are the uh, collections that are currently available to the public. I personally have been working on the Park County uh, manuscript collection, uh, ma mainly with the Smith family papers. Uh, the Smith family was a prominent family in Park County in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, who worked a lot on the uh, development of Fair Play Colorado. Um, and you can see there's some of the yearbooks that I have personally scanned and uploaded uh, from handling them from start to finish. Uh, and I'm sure you can probably tell, but the project is hosted on Omeka, which has come with its own share of pros and cons. Um, we've had a few display issues, but it looks like everything's working now. Um, and yeah, there's just there's a large variety of material from around. Uh, we have surveys, we have law documents, letters, uh, scrapbooks. I haven't uploaded those yet, sorry. Uh, they're really neat, I promise. Um, yearbooks, uh, all kinds of things. And if you want to go up to back to the menu and then browse exhibits, uh, this is where this archive really shines, I think. Um, if you want to click on any of those, uh, Towns and Settlements is a good one, mining. And here, uh, volunteers and workers have done a lot of work to actually contextualize what are in these exhibits. Um, and just giving a little bit more about the history of uh, Park County, uh, the different things that have happened there. Um, there's been the, there's one exhibit that hasn't, it isn't displayed yet because they're still working on it uh, that features a lot of those photographs that were taken by a volunteer and then donated. Um, but there's uh, going to be an exhibit, hopefully near towards the end of spring, that's documenting uh, the history of Chinese immigrants in the area, uh, talking about, you know, the difficulties that they faced, um, the contributions that they made to the area. Uh, we have oral histories available for listening. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's it's a fascinating project that we've uh, been able to put together. And I'm not really sure what else to say. I was really blown out of the water by everyone else's uh, uh, talks about all the amazing things that they're doing. And then here I am, and I'm just like, I've been helping scan things and it's great. <laughs> Okay. No, this is this is a, this is an incredible collection, and I, I love I love the way it's kind of bringing people together. Um, and and like you're saying, sort of volunteers getting enthusiastic and going out and taking pictures and kind of building these exhibits to contextualize it. Um, it's it's really great work. Yeah, I think if you actually go to the search function, um, you could probably search for those photos, Sam Carlson. And that should bring up all the photos that they took. Yeah, there they are. Uh, so Sam was That's a wonderful really cool. volunteer. She went out to, she she took like trips to Fair Play and Park County and uh, found the areas that had items related to them and then just took photos of those historic places and donated them all to the archive in the initiative. Uh, so you can find, you know, pictures of the cemeteries that were mentioned. Um, I think if you go to one of the later pages, you can find a picture of, uh, the remains of a garden terrace that was created by some of the Chinese immigrants living in the area, uh, who weren't allowed to live in the towns themselves. So they got pushed to kind of the outskirts, mm -hmm. uh, and took to terrace farming to try and subsist. Uh, it's, it's a really fascinating part of Colorado's history, I feel like, and I just 
was happy to share it. So there it is. Thanks so much for sharing it. I'm glad you joined us today. This is great. Yeah, of course. All right, so we've got 15 minutes left and we've got three more folks to get through. So I'm gonna keep pushing forward. Thanks everyone for sticking it out. This has been great so far. Uh, next up is Lauren Goodley from Texas State. All right. Um, hi everyone, I am feeling like I've gone through all the emotions of like, this is amazing and trying to take different pieces and learning and then getting just a little bit overwhelmed by the amazingness in this group. So I appreciate everybody. And um, thank you, um, Elliot, for bringing us all together. I wanted to share this kind of wackadoo non-digital project. And um, that wasn't in my notes. Let me find my notes. The notes say that we created um, this Global Palestine Project, which was an outreach tool to promote and provide resources and context for an archival collection that does not have any digital content. So um, that archival collection is the literary papers of San Antonio poet Naomi Shihab Nye. Um, Shihab Nye is Palestinian America and part of the Palestinian diaspora. So there were sort of a lot of um, things that surfaced by doing this project. Um, which I will get to, I'm gonna follow my notes. Um, so yeah, we made the story map. Um, I worked with two faculty members and two librarians. So I was sort of um, the organizer. I didn't really add that much other than getting people connected to the right people. Um, they, the uh, faculty gave their content expertise and then the ArcGIS librarian, and we'll see in a minute, the subject librarian created a libguide. So once, um, Nathaniel in ArcGIS sort of put our um, pins in for us. Um, and this was the first map just to sort of visualize. And this is meant, I, I take, um, somebody earlier was saying story map is a little bit limited and I definitely felt that. And it worked well for this project because um, we weren't doing a lot of, um, it's not meant to be a digital exhibit, but a digital entry point. So this is sort of, you know, I can imagine giving like <clears throat> a high school class saying, pick somebody on this map to do your project on. And, and, um, and then this is just sort of visualizing that the diaspora of Palestinians and thus archives about um, Palestine and Palestinians. Um, so, uh, bugga, bugga, bugga. yeah, um, it, do you have the libguide up? That was the other thing I was gonna kind of go through. Yeah, oh, I forgot how they linked. Um, yes, so this is what the um, history subject librarian put together for us. And um, the, the databases one is, um, librarians are amazing. And I wanted to just note that um, I was excited about all the databases of primary sources online about this material, but then the League of Nations materials when we started this project, um, there was, it was pre-pandemic and there was a big push to digitize everything in the League of Nations. That was the plan. And I uh, do not have an inside line, but that has been tabled. So we're back to the microfilm. So again, with my anti-digital voice that the microfilm is available in only about three places in the country and um, Texas State University is one of them. So I'm glad that we kept that in there um, to highlight sort of the rich resources on the Palestinian diaspora available in Central Texas and then sort of where to go from there as far as studying that. So. I'm going to be quiet. Thanks for having me and letting me share this um, project. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I really love this idea of, like you said, kind of a, a digital entry point to this collection and, and using that as a, a way to engage people with this archival collection, even though it doesn't have have a digital component at this point. And I'm kind of also idea. hoping engaging administrators who feel like everything needs to be digital sometimes. I can be, look, it's digital, even though there's just no way that was going to happen. So anyways, thanks again.
Thanks, Lauren. All right, next up, Emma Stanford from the Hoover Institution. Emma, are you here? Hi, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, no, um, you're great. Couldn't figure out how to unmute, but thanks for thanks for sticking with it, everyone, to the end. Um, yeah, so I manage digitization and digital services at the Hoover Institution Library and Archives out in California, and um, we mainly collect materials related to war, revolution, and peace. And one of our founding or foundational collections is to do with um, American relief for the famine in Soviet Russia after the First World War. So I just wanted to show this sort of online exhibit portal, which um, we built to complement a physical exhibit that we have on at the moment. Disclaimer, I didn't actually build any of this. I worked with the people who did, um, but I was the one on the mailing list and we, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll do my best to represent their work accurately, but I can't get too much into the weeds of the technical details. So, um, one of the things that we were trying to achieve with this is sort of a very lightweight exhibit website, not a whole separate website that we would then have to maintain. So this is just a page on our institutional website, which is um, a Drupal 9, I think, platform. Um, and we use shorthand, uh, which is similar to ArcGIS story maps, um, but a little different to create a lot of digital stories. So if you scroll down and click on um, the doctors in a famine thing, so this is one of the stories. So we digitized like 4,000 images from our various collections related to the American Relief Administration in Soviet Russia. And then our exhibition team put together all these digital stories with narratives that sort of mimicked the user journey through the exhibit itself. So we have a bunch of images from our digital collections featured in various ways. And if you scroll down a little more, you can see that there's um, a link to a digital record in a lot of these citations, which will take you through to our digital, um, our actual digital collection website. So these are, it's not, we're not like embedding a viewer from our website, it's very basic. We're just sort of linking through and using static images. Um, there is a lot of this content we actually restricted on our website because it's um, potentially quite traumatic to view. There's a lot of content related to starvation and death and illness. So some of these are available on the website. Some of them have these content warning screens that you would have to click through to actually see the content. Um, and um, we have a few notices in different places on the site just to explain um, the types of potentially sensitive or disturbing content that you might see and allow people to make the choice about whether or not to view it. Um, and let's see, if you go back a page again uh, and then scroll down a little more, we also have these student projects, which is really exciting. So we have some Stanford University students who worked with the collection in person and online. And if you just click on, the, yeah, just try clicking on that one. Um, one of the students put together this digital story to um, showcase some of the research that he was doing. And again, it's mainly using images from our own collections of stuff we've digitized, but there's also some records from other institutions uh, in North America and Europe. So we're linking to other institutions' digital records if we have them. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's. Um, there's some wonkiness in the display, I guess. I think um, the people who built all of this have, uh, yeah, torn their hair out a few times over the difficulties of formatting stuff and like dealing with bugs in the software. I would say that shorthand seems to work fairly well. It's not clear like how well it will work in the long term with updates and updates to Drupal, updates to shorthand. Um, but because it's all fairly static, I like our chances of being able to preserve it or emulate it further down the road. I would love to move toward more like embedding, directly embedding the image content using IIIF, but um, that's something that we talked about and it kind of just didn't serve the exhibit team's needs as well as just sort of having images that they could resize and crop and all that stuff and not have to worry with embedding an external viewer. 
So um, yeah, I think this might be the model that we follow for future exhibits. We've done much more involved websites in the past for different exhibits, but I think this sort of has the, a reasonable balance of like flexibility, but also not being too difficult to build or maintain. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I um, I think a lot of us can relate to that, wanting something lightweight and sustainable that we can keep up over the, the long term, but also that meets our needs and does all of the exciting, cool things that we want to do. Um, so definitely attention there, but, but this is really great. All right. Uh, so last but most definitely not least, we started with Texas Women's and we're going to bookend with Texas Women. So Kimberly... Talking about the Florence Nightingale Digital Archive. Um, thank you, Elliot. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm using a new setup today. So you sound great. Um, I'm going to make this quick um, because this is not a new digital collection, but what I heard today were a lot of themes that I wanted to put out, um, bring up, and, and I loved hearing the themes about volunteers and student projects and um, data visualization. Um, this collection actually came about through, um, through the donor, and we started talking in 2014 about this collection, and um, it is... Um, as we understand and the research that both the, the owner of this collection and what we've done in our research is that it is the largest collection of Florence Nightingale artifacts and ephemera um, outside of the uh, Florence Nightingale Museum in um, England, uh, held by a private owner. And so it also happens to be one of our alumni and former faculty um, who has this collection. So we started these discussions in 2014. And then by 2015, we had negotiated a um, a contract to put this exhibit on view. And uh, since then, uh, it has just morphed, and especially in this last year, we've seen a new evolution of a, of a collection that we've had online um, be used in very new and innovative ways. And, and some of those ways have been um, through um, one of the things I'm really excited about is, is different assignments that we've first started doing and developing with our own faculty here on our Denton, Dallas, and Houston campuses that has then turned into um, assignments working with faculty at other institutions that have nursing programs. Um, I think and, and just seeing how a collection, a historical collection um, in nursing can be used in a way to teach today's nursing um, and, and, and our future nurses. I think also we saw some when the pandemic happened and with COVID, um, seeing how it was going to be used in the classroom and seeing our nursing instructors find ways to re-envision Florence Nightingale and a pandemic world that we were living in. One of the really exciting ways is um, the end of last year, one of our former students is now teaching and um, because of her exposure to this collection back in 2016, 2017, she's now wanting, she's going to be teaching a class over the summer and she's wanting to uh, incorporate this collection, this digital collection into her curriculum. Um, I think the other beautiful thing being in special collections is seeing how that, you know, how we can get a collection online and we can unveil not just the collection, but the history and the story behind it and all those stories behind it. And over the last year, we've really seen an interest in people who have their own stories about how they came into nursing and what nursing meant to them, who are, who are sharing their stories or sharing portions of their own collections with us. And so while it may not be directly related to Florence Nightingale, Florence Nightingale had an impact in connecting us with them. Um, I loved hearing Morgan talk about the visualization, the data visualization and data curation, because many may not know that Florence Nightingale is the one who developed the pie chart. And she was collecting data when she was in the Crimea. And, um, and some of those items we actually have in this collection. But what we've seen with a couple of our faculty that we're working with who are who um, 
I would love to say that there are our own faculty here at our institution, but they're not, that we're being able to connect them with faculty here are working on, you know, how can we juxtapose that data collection that Florence Nightingale was doing with how we collect data today. And um, so that just seeing how a collection can just, a digital collection when it's online, how it can just the ideas are endless, the possibilities are endless, things that we were, we never imagined, I certainly never imagined we'd be talking about data with a Florence Nightingale digital collection back in 2015, 2014, 2016, um, in those early days, and, and now we're having um, those discussions and, and finding ways to connect. Um, I will share one of the really interesting items that we're looking to add to the collection that just came about this year is a wonderful artifact from Florence Nightingale's time period. And of course, she's known as the lady with the lamp, um, but we are gonna be um, putting on display and um, Kristen Clark and her team uh, will be able to photograph this and, and, and I'm just learning about it. So nobody knows about it yet, but we are uh, getting a, um, a lamp, not the one that Florence Nightingale carried, but one that was from that time period. And so just being able to have that kind of artifact that again, it's, it's not an exact, but it, we can connect it to her and in that way from that original time period speaks in such a way that it's not, you know, it's not just a collection for our nursing students and our health studies students. We can connect it to, you know, history, sociology, anthropology, whatever it might be, so interdisciplinary in sharing that. So I leave with that the work that everybody does to build these digital collections is continually evolving and is always growing and taking um, sprouting, you know, new seeds and, and new blooms that for me, it's just so awesome to see. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. What what a wonderful way to sort of wrap this up. And thank you for sort of articulating those themes that we've heard in a bunch of these um, presentations and, and things folks are sharing today. Um, as you said, it's just, it's so wonderfully inspiring. And um, there's so much incredible work being done on so many fronts by so many people um, in Texas, our colleagues around the country. Um, so thank you all for joining today, for sharing your projects and your thoughts and your ideas. Um, I really always feel so inspired by these, these presentations and these sessions. Um, it's just so much fun. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, as I said, we will share out the recording of this webinar with everyone who registered, as well as the notes um, that has links to all of these great projects that everyone can continue to explore. I definitely am planning on spending a lot more time with a lot of these sites myself. Um, as I one more thing, as a final reminder, um, again, TDL would love to have you join our community. Please email us at info at tdl.org if you'd like to learn more about joining our consortium or any of our services. Um, thank you again for joining us. Take care and have a great rest of your day, everyone.